Buyers have been robbed of their right to get a home inspection when buying a home, as over the last several years, lack of inventory has produced multiple offer situations for competing home buyers nationwide. And for the last several years, home buyer exuberance has pushed many placing offers on homes to a trend of buying a home as is, relieving home sellers from making repairs or replacing end of life mechanical systems to their home. But for many home buyers, especially for those that have purchased homes before, they seem to be completely fine with the concept of no home inspections. And when asking home buyers why they're comfortable waiving their home inspection rights, many of them say that home inspections are just another racket in the housing market that's simply not necessary. Unfortunately, for the most part, I totally agree. Hey, welcome back to this week's Real Estate Q&A, where I address housing market concerns, as well as discuss five viewers' comments from the last week on our YouTube channel. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Todd Sachs, a real estate broker and founder of Sachs Realty. So as a contractor of more than 30 years, my experience is that many home inspectors, my sellers have dealt with, and I did say sellers because as a listing agent, you're seeing what other buyers agents or buyers have, you know, who they've hired to actually get these home inspections. When I'm helping buyers, I try and give them good home inspectors that have construction experience and background. But many of these uh, inspectors that I've dealt with over the years have really been a joke. And I've spoken with so many home buyers that shortly after settlement, those that have had to spend, you know, thousands of dollars in repairs to items that they felt that their home inspector that they hired and spent a lot of money with, um, that they should have discovered these items and they feel burned and uh, really upset that they, uh, you know, that they weren't informed uh, better with the home inspector during their inspection process. Well, this can be yet another disservice to home buyers subjected to these bad home inspectors that they trusted knew more about an actual home than they really did. But you may not be surprised that just like real estate agents, there is a very low barrier to entry into the home inspection business. There is no on-the-job construction experience required in order to become a home inspector. Now, before I go any further, I want to be clear. I am not recommending that a home buyer waive their home inspection rights, but you should be aware of who you're hiring and know their qualifications and limitations. Now, there are very good home inspectors out there, but many agents don't align themselves with these home inspectors, as sometimes real estate agents call a too thorough home inspector as a deal killer actually finding things about the home that could prevent the buyer and seller from actually negotiating a favorable resolve, thus ending the opportunity for that agent to receive a commission check should the deal fall through. Now, before we cover some important do's and don'ts about your home inspection, do your research and look up the requirements to become a licensed home inspector in your state. For example, in my state of Maryland, in order to apply for a home inspector license, one must complete an application and remit photocopies of course certificates reflecting their completion of 72 hours of an on-site classroom-based training course approved by the commission. They must provide evidence having obtained a high school diploma or its equivalents, including high school transcripts or college diploma or college transcripts. They must provide an examination score report verifying successful completion of the National Home Inspector's examination. You can check out PSI Home Inspection Candidate Bulletin for more information on that. Then they must remit a non-refundable application review fee in the amount of $50. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, no prior on-the-job home construction experience is required. To find a home inspector, many home buyers solely rely on their real estate agent to recommend a home inspector. And I get it, because if you're a first-time buyer especially, uh, you, don't, you may not know even 
other uh, buyers that have purchased many houses before, they don't really stay in touch with home inspectors, but always do your own research. As I just mentioned, there could be a conflict of interest in home situations where as the inspector may value the actual relationship with the real estate agent, the buyer's agent, your agent, because they feed them continuous work and they might care about them a little bit more than you. Now, that sounds bad to say, but human nature sometimes uncovers things like this. But based on my experience, there are a few things that you should know when preparing for a home inspection. So let's talk about what you may want first from the sellers, right? So you're under contract and now you have your inspection contingency period. And uh, so you want to make sure that a couple things are conveyed to the seller and you would typically do that from your agent to theirs. So the big thing here is accessibility. Home inspectors are not allowed to move furniture away from things like outlets or access doors so request that any furniture that could be covering these areas that it's slid away from the walls enough that the inspector can get behind the furniture to access these types of things maybe if you're listening to this video and you haven't purchased a home yet you would add that to your checklist to take note when you're looking at the house should you be successful in putting an offer in and getting an opportunity to have a home inspection before you buy it. Also, if there are any crawl spaces, and this is a big one, under the home, and this is where a lot of problems could be with the structure of the home. Uh, they have a crawl space and not a lot of states have crawl spaces um, or basements, but a crawl space is typically like an unclimatized area where the house is actually elevated, the floor of the home inside rooms, are elevated a certain distance off the ground. This is where we would consider it a crawl space. There is usually like a vapor barrier down there to prevent soil smells from entering the house. And um, it's usually insulated, uh, things like that. But a lot of times these access doors are screwed shut. And the inspector, they uh, most of them, that I, in my experience, they won't take out a screw gun. They're not unscrewing anything. Um, other than a panel, front panel to a electrical panel. Uh, but you want to make sure that if they are secured, these crawl space doors, that uh, they're unscrewed or unlocked prior to inspection day. Also make sure that access points to the attic are clear from personal belongings. I've seen situations where, you know, the inspector can't get up into the attic because the people are moving or maybe they intentionally put things in front of the attic way um, they're not going to move boxes and, like I said, furniture to be able to get a ladder or have a ladder pull down access to the attic. And you definitely want that space inspected. This, again, will be your agent's responsibility because you're not directly, not yet. We may be getting to a point where buyers are unrepresented more often um, and we're working on some courses to help our buyers and sellers navigate maybe without an agent or at least to educate them should they decide to do that one day. But anyway, now you're probably going to be dealing with your agent conveying what I'm saying or suggesting or recommending to you to the listing agent. And then their responsibility is to make sure it's done by the sellers for inspection day. But prior to the inspection, something else I want to suggest, and a lot of people don't do this, but when you sign a contract, usually you're not getting an inspection until you've agreed on a contract and you have an accepted contract in place. Well, what I want you to do prior to inspection day is I want you to re-familiarize yourself with any seller disclosures that they may have told you. Maybe that the basement leaks in heavy rains. Maybe something doesn't work. Um, they've ahead of time disclosed these to you and you've kind of accepted that as the terms, but you may want to bring it up to your home inspector when you're actually in the home on inspection day so that you could find out maybe what it could cost uh, to fix or how severe um, that disclosure, whatever it was, is disclosed, you know, what kind of implications that would have. Now, prior to hiring an inspector, which is your next job, is to check out their reviews. Call the inspector and ask for their qualifications. Were they contractors before? How long have they been inspecting homes? And what 
is and is not covered in their home inspection. Now, I want to talk for a second about everybody's first day on the job because, yes, I even have one myself. I wasn't born knowing what I know about construction and and housing. But that's the company's problem, (laughs) okay? When you find somebody, if you're a home inspector and you're like, I'm really offended by this guy telling people that only use people that have experience, not somebody that just took a 72-hour course. Well, guess what? Part of your job is to do a little bit of apprenticeship. Maybe you should be shadowing somebody for a year. That's the company's problem, not mine and not yours. And that's why I'm giving you this advice. So anyway, and another thing that I want to talk about, so why would you say, well, what are you going to do in the home inspection? What is included in the home inspection? Because what you've asked for in a home inspection, one inspector may not do it all. And that's fine. That sometimes may even be preferred. But you have to know what of what inspections you want, what jobs can they do, and what should you expect. And something very popular that I'm seeing now is inspectors not getting on roofs. And a lot of this is because they have 72 hours experience in the classroom. They've never climbed on a roof before. They may not be okay with heights. You need somebody on a roof. So if your home inspector that you selected is only going to use drone photography, call a roofing company, pay a little bit extra, and have somebody get on that roof so that they can look at caulking, uh, flashing, get a really, you know, a a hands-on look on that roof, not just by some aerial photography from a drone. Walk the roof. Is it spongy? You can't tell that from a drone. But also you may ask how long will the inspection process be and how many inspectors will be there? A lot of companies nowadays respect everybody's time and they have two inspectors show up at the inspection. One will cover one floor, one will cover another. But ask, do they have the ability to give you a cost estimate for the repair or replacement that they would be recommending? Because if they don't, only having a 72-hour course under their belt, they may not be able to give you what you need at that moment during the home inspection to get back to the sellers or to even determine if you should walk away. Okay, so this brings us to another point that your inspector is not going to cover. If the home has a furnace and central AC and the equipment is over 10 years old, I would say probably even over eight or nine years old. You're going to want to have an HVAC contractor come and look at that and do an actual inspection, HVAC contractor inspection, because your home inspector is not going to check things like the A coil. That is A coil, not a coil. Um, it's, It's called the A coil. It sits on top of the furnace in most cases, and a lot of times um, that's that's not replaced. So they may have done a change out, um, you know, eight or nine years ago. They may have changed the furnace. They may not have changed the A coil. And when it's sealed up with duct tape, your home inspector is not going to cut that duct tape or take it off um, to check it out. And so what happens is you buy it. All of a sudden, your AC stops working. You get a service technician that comes out, and they tell you the A coil is completely disintegrated because the sellers only changed out the furnace. And depending on the age of the home, you may want to hire an actual electrician to inspect the electrical systems in the home. And for one of these reasons is if it's an older home, um, it could have aluminum wiring in there and it could actually be a fire hazard. It's not a bad idea also to scope the sewer line of older homes because this is a very costly repair should you need to dig up the yard 10 or 12 feet deep to replace a broken sewer line or one that is clogged with either roots from an existing tree or trees that have been removed. So a lot of times people sell a house, they had a tree in their front yard, they had it removed. Nobody knows it now because it's nice plush grass, but those roots got into the sewer system. So I I would suggest if your house is more than certainly 30 years old, I would recommend always getting a sewer line inspection. So what I'm getting at here is that you have to take responsibility, unfortunately, to watch videos like this, to learn about buying a home, uh, because your agent may not always tell you these things. And ultimately, you're the one that will pay the price for bad advice should you make the wrong decision on a home inspector or an agent. So before we get to this week's comments and questions, 
<laughs> let me segue into that our podcasts are brought to you by none other than SaxRealty.com. If you're looking to buy, sell, lease, or rent, and you're in Maryland, well, hopefully the choice is easy for you to call me. If you live anywhere else in the country, visit our preferred referral network on SaxRealty.com. You simply scroll down to the map of the United States, click on a state and city, and find an agent near you. Now, this program is relatively new for us here at Sax Realty, so if you don't see someone in your state or city, feel free to send me an email, reach out to me directly. I'll be sure to recommend an agent in your area that I trust. So now for this week's comments and questions. So our first commenter is um, responding to our last Tuesday Night Live where we had John Cutsmita, a, uh, a mortgage company owner, uh, flew in and uh, so it was a live show we were talking about you know uh, home prices and it was a debate and um, you know there a lot of heated back and forth between him and I at the end of the day <laughs> I always question people's boots on the ground perspective uh, because you know depending on how many transactions somebody does or you know how long they've been in the business really impacts um, what they're saying, because are you either reading some manipulated chart or do you actually go out into the field or the industry and transact and see what's happening day to day? But one of the things that we talked about was that it took a long time during the great financial crisis for home prices. If you purchased a house in 2006 to be able to sell your house or at least a break even point, um, which requires more, requires about 10% equity to break even on a house where you have to pay transfer, recordation fees, commissions, things like that, not counting any upgrades you've put in the house. But the argument was, um, which I know for a fact, is that it took a decade for home prices to come back up. And in some cases, it took sellers till 22, 2022, before they can actually sell their house for what they paid for it at the height of the market in 2006. And John flat out said, that's not true. So before you put your foot in your mouth and tell me that something's not true, you should know the facts. So somebody said, Todd is right. We bought our house in 2006 here in Michigan. We didn't see the break even point until 2018. Even that date was questionable depending on demand and local comps. Well, John responded that that's Michigan, that's not nationally, and it wasn't the norm. Well, that's not true. <laughs> so what I want to say here is the fact that what, not to get into a who's right and who's wrong match, but everything, you know, if, you, if you're going to say something, be prepared to have the data to back it up, as John would say. You can Google it. It took at least a decade for home prices nationwide to rebound. And depending on what price point you're in, it took until the height of the market in 2022 to peak where prices were 2006, maybe a year or two off. But my point is when you're buying a house at the top of the market, any type of home price correction can prevent you from selling that home and walking away without needing to bring money to the settlement table. So um, it is cautious times to be buying a house because I believe that we're going to see home price, price decline even more than what we've seen already since 2022. Uh, so anyway, um, now that that's out of the way, the next comment here says that, so people who are credit stressed get to take out more credit to tap into the tiny bit of money or equity that they've put into their already existing loan. This country is screwed, is what this commenter was saying. This also refers to a couple of podcasts where I have said this new Freddie Mac program that is coming out is bad news. And essentially what Freddie Mac wants to be able to do is buy these um, loans or trade second mortgages on the secondary market. And so this has been put out for comment. That date has been closed. A lot of people believe that even though they put it out for public comment or industry comment, that's already been decided that we're going to have an encouraging period of time 
where lenders are going to try and get you to suck out the equity that you have in your home and get a second mortgage. So the issue with this, when I was talking to John, who's a mortgage loan officer, owns a mortgage company, he thinks it's a great idea because people get to pay off their very high priced credit card bills. Well, there's two issues that come into play. He said it's a great idea because it'll still be at an 80% loan to value uh, valuation meaning that if they needed to sell their house, they would still have the equity or the cushion to sell their house as quickly as they can. A home is not fungible, meaning that no two homes are exactly the same, and a home is not a liquid asset. That doesn't mean that if you get into trouble that you will be able to sell your home, even if you have a 20% cushion. We may be in a bad time where nobody's buying or they're not willing to give you 50% of the value for your home. So it's not always a guarantee when you're getting into more debt. The other thing is, what are you going to do with your credit cards when you pay them off? Are you going to shred them up? Probably not. So what's going to happen is people are going to suck out all the equity in their house. They're going to have a more expensive mortgage payment on a monthly basis, and they're going to rack their credit card debt back up again, because that's mostly what people do when they need their credit cards to survive. This program for people to get second mortgages on the house are clearly for people that don't have money. Why are we preying on people that don't have money? Just to kick this can down the road. Makes no sense. So maybe you can tell me a good reason why we should do it. Drop the comment below. I'd love to see them. But I think that encouraging more debt on top of the over trillion dollar consumer debt credit card debt where people are carrying balances on high interest cards by paying them off with your home's equity is not going to solve the unaffordability problem that we have in the country. And I asked John, well, as a loan officer, what do you think they're spending their money on? And he said things like, I don't know, going to the ballpark or something. I said, well, do you ever think that maybe they're buying food or financing their groceries? He said it didn't matter. Well, I think it does. Our next comment is from an agent in the industry. And uh, she goes on to say, I'm looking at these comments from a video that we have published. And most of these folks do not seem to value the work of an agent does to bring buyers and sellers together. We spend countless hours climbing through inventory for buyers, trying to find pre-market inventory, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. But I want to tell you, Charlotte, because I do appreciate your comment and you sound like you're probably a great agent and I believe that great agents are necessary. But what we have to do is realize that we have a systemic problem in this industry. And as I mentioned earlier, with it being such a low barrier to entry and that companies are simply not taking on the responsibility of proper training and apprenticeship in this industry on helping people with the largest purchase that most will ever make in their lifetime. You have to understand the disappointment of the public and why we have a lot of damage control to do. So though Charlotte, I do appreciate you and I do believe that we will be around despite what John, my last guest said regarding agents not being necessary. I believe that we are. So anyway, um, again, I'd love to see your comments. I'm sure you'll load them up based on that. But I understand. I understand the sentiments. Our next comment says, I just read $10,000 homeowner insurance. What? It's not worth owning, yet renting is unaffordable. And this was on a Florida video that I did with Phil Simonetta. He's in our broker referral network. Um, and uh, we were talking about how Floridians, people are leaving the state of Florida, but it's not just Florida. It's Colorado. It's California. It's in a lot of places. Uh, where insurance rates are costing buyers and homeowners their ability to maintain their affordability. So there's two things that come to mind here. Um, one of my agents just in the last week had said that they were under contract um, or about to sign the contract uh, on a home that they wanted to buy, and they had to bid $20,000 thereabouts over asking price. And when they... Uh, realize what the insurance payment would be on the house, they couldn't afford it and they backed out. So what a lot of home buyers don't realize is there are two things that are going to change in your monthly payment when you buy a home. One are your property taxes. They are guaranteed to go up regardless of whether you have a homestead tax credit to where they 
slow down the increments, you know, or phase in the values over time, they're still going to go up every single assessment year. And uh, it will change your escrow payment that you're, ma you're making on your mortgage payment. Um, the other thing is your insurance, because that will also go up. So insurance company nowadays are doing flyovers or drive-bys, and they're looking at properties and saying, oh, it looks like this porch needs to be repaired, or it looks like the roof needs to be repaired. And they'll simply send you a cancellation notice unless you fix certain things, um, or it will put you into you know getting insurance that is a higher risk and a more expensive policy. And quite honestly, I'm seeing this change people's payments uh, by you know homeowners' payments by five to eight hundred dollars a month in some areas in just one year. So a lot of money to be careful about or uh, more questions to ask when you're buying a home. And then finally, uh, enjoyed the back and forth. Great points made by John going back to the Tuesday Night Live. Would have loved to hear thoughts on how much inventory could come to the market if mortgage rates did drop by four and a half to five and a half percent. So John is from the belief um, again, being in the mortgage industry, that we will see mortgage rates, 30 year fixed rate mortgage rates in the fours again. Uh, I hope not. I hope that we don't. I think that this is one of the reasons why asset prices uh, were uh, permitted to go haywire. Um, there is the concept that um, you know, one may believe that if money hadn't been so cheap, uh, there would be more houses for people to buy uh, because they wouldn't have second and third homes. The other thing is, you know, when I'm talking about inventory is I really think that we are just a little bit away from seeing a flood of real estate houses on the market. The big things are the obvious. We have 30 million baby boomers that are getting at retirement age, passing away, um, consolidating uh, families or, or moving in together, multi-generational housing, and uh, just which isn't a bad thing, but just like we had prior to the last probably 25, 30 years. Um, but there's a lot of inventory out there with these baby boomers that are, will probably be hitting the market over the next three to five years. Not only that, but we see these uh, Airbnb uh, purchases that a lot of people have made uh, that are getting cost out of uh, the market with insurance and HOA fees and um, repair costs and things like that. And a lot of the municipalities are actually banning them nationwide. So I think we're going to start to see more of this inventory hit the market. And a lot of the people that would, would just like to downsize or even upsize and uh, maybe get a bigger home and sell that more affordable home that they own now, they're probably waiting for some type of adjustment or correction to mortgage rates that may be something in the fives, uh, may be practical for them or even in the low sixes. Uh, where it will not make them feel so bad of giving up that 4% mortgage rate. So anyway, thanks so much, guys. I love your comments and questions. Keep them coming. Uh, you never know, you may be on next week's real estate Q&A. Uh, but also, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please consider doing so now. Hit that alert bell. You'll know every time we upload content just like this. And if you like the video, you can let me know that you did by smashing that thumbs up. It actually helped the algorithms push it out that more people can learn about the housing market. And don't keep this content all to yourself. The biggest compliment that you can offer me, your host, is to share this video with your loved ones and friends. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.